And today we're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures, all New Testament scriptures today, beginning in the book of Hebrews, and then we're going to be going to Romans, and then Revelation, 1 John. We're going to be all over the place this morning, so be prepared to turn in your Bible. We'll try to give you time between stops here to look at it, but they'll be up on the screen up here as well. I can remember as a boy going to my grandmother's church out in the country in what was that time called Sugarland or Missouri City outside of Houston. Today it's a city unto itself, I mean a big city. And back then they were hunting rabbits out there right outside the church. And it, it, it's country, it really was. And I remember they had the old country preachers and they would come in there and they were always preaching about the cross. They were always preaching about the blood. And I wondered as a little boy, I said, is that all they know to preach about? You don't hear much of it anymore. You hear all kinds of stuff, but you don't hear much about the cross and about the blood. Well, today we're going back a few centuries. All right, we're going to go back to the roots of what we're really all about. Washed in the blood of Jesus. Christianity is a bloody religion. But it's more than a religion, it's, it's a relationship. And it's a bloody relationship between holy God and sinful man. God wants to have an intimate, loving, eternal relationship with each one of us. He really does. And we can have that relationship, except there's a problem, and the problem is sin. Sin keeps us from having that relationship with God. It, it's a barrier, but it's a barrier that can be removed. But it can only be removed one way. And that's through the blood of Jesus. Amen. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. Because that barrier gets removed when our sins are forgiven and taken away. And we're going to be elaborating on that a little bit. Let's begin in Hebrews chapter 9. I, I, we got John 19 up there, but that's okay. Just go to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 22. But the last part of that verse, it says, Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Remission means forgiveness. Unless there is bloodshed, God says, I won't forgive. And it's not talking about just any blood, but He's talking about the blood of His dear Son, Jesus. In other words, if you and I cut ourselves and we bleed, we say, Okay, God, I'm forgiven, right? And He says, No. No. You're, you're a sinner. We have to have sinless blood. We have to have holy, righteous blood. There's only one person who ever had the blood that can take away our sins, and that's Jesus. But without that, there is no forgiveness. Are you with me? And we'll see that a little bit more in detail. I'm going to back up what I'm saying as we look at the Scriptures, because God's Word is our authority. The sin that separates us from holy God has to be forgiven, or we cannot enter into heaven. If God forgave all of our sins except one, we'd be disqualified for a fraction of a second to be in heaven. If we could take one sin into heaven with us, heaven would no longer be heaven. It would no longer be holy. It is a holy place. And God's not going to let, us, let heaven lose its holiness over one sin. So our sins have to be totally and completely forgiven. And in order for that to happen, it takes the blood of Jesus. For over a thousand years before Jesus was born, they were sacrificing sheep and, and goats and, and animals and bulls and, 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 and sacrifice for sin offerings. But that blood didn't take away in sin. But what it did, it gave them a picture of the fact that God was going to send a perfect sacrifice. He was going to send the perfect lamb, the one that John the Baptist identified as the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Getting them prepared that they could trust the Savior when He came. It was a foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice. By His blood, all of our sins can be forgiven. I want you to go with me now to Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 9.
It says, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him, from wrath through Him. He's writing to Christian people. He says, we are being justified now by His blood. What does justified mean? A lot of us think, well, if I'm justified, that means if somebody does me wrong and they poke me in the nose, I'm justified to poke them back. Well, that's not what this means. Justified here means forgiven. Totally and completely forgiven. That means that our sin record is erased. It's gone. Absolute, complete forgiveness. Not one sin left on our account. In other words, if you've been justified, you will stand before God on judgment day and when everybody's long list of sins are being revealed and they open the books where all the sins are listed, they're going to come to your name and it's going to be blank. Nothing there. Not one sin remains. Why? Because you've been justified. How did you get justified? Right there, by the blood of Jesus. And we'll be saved from His wrath. When you read about the judgment and you read about the wrath of God, you understand the wrath of God means He takes sinners who refused His Son as their Savior and Lord and cast them into hell. It's the second death, the lake of fire. That's the wrath of God. We cannot imagine or comprehend how horrible that is. God gives us a hint. A fire that doesn't go out. A stench that goes up, the screams of the people. We're all alone in total darkness and fire. You say, how can you have fire and darkness? Hell, fire is dark. I don't know. I haven't been there. Not planning on going. But that's what the Bible says it's like. And there's no exit. There's no end to it. The wrath of God, when once it's poured out like that, it never, ever, ever stops. But we can be justified, have all of our sins forgiven, and saved from God's wrath. So when people say, I've been saved, that's what we're getting saved from. I think it's interesting. The word justified, somebody defined it a long time ago when sins are totally forgiven and all charges are dropped. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. I like that. So forgiven is like I never sinned at all, even though I know I did. Justified. Have you been justified? It takes the blood of Jesus to do that. Let's go a little bit farther. In 1 John chapter 1, give you a moment to turn there. That's back closer to the book of Revelation. Not the Gospel of John, but the epistle of 1 John, the first letter. Chapter 1 and verse 7, the latter part of that verse tells us, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That backs it up. That tells us again, when you're justified, all sin is forgiven. Totally and completely. The blood of Jesus Christ does it. You say, okay, if the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin, how does that happen? I mean, it's just poof. Is it just done? Is it just automatic? Or is there a process of some sort that justifies me, that washes and cleanses us from my sin? How does it happen? Revelation chapter 1 tells us. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 tells us how the blood of Jesus washes away our sins. Look, you'll find there not only is the blood of Jesus the only thing that can wash away our sins, but there's only one person that can do it. Revelation, the last book in your Bible, the very first chapter of that book in verse 5 the last part of that verse says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And the first part of that verse identifies the hymn as Jesus Christ. Did you get it? Jesus Christ loves us. You say, man, if he knew me like I know me, he wouldn't love me. He knows you even better than you do. And he still loves you in spite of you. He loves me in spite of me, and He knows me better than I do, and there's a whole bunch about me I don't even like. But He loves us. He really does. So much that He sacrificed Himself. <laughs> and He washes us 
in His own blood. That's how it happens. That's how the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That's how the blood of Jesus justifies us and makes us pure enough and clean enough to go to heaven when we die. There's even more. More than just having our sins forgiven, more than just being justified, the Bible tells us that He redeems us. So Christian, listen to me. If you're sure that your sins have been forgiven, you're sure if Jesus Christ has saved you, and you're sure you're a Christian in every sense of the word, then you can be certain that you are justified, totally forgiven. There is no sin record for you on Judgment Day. Plus, you are redeemed. And that makes it even sweeter. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 tells us about being redeemed. And again, here we have a letter written to Christian people saying you've been redeemed. We sing the song about being redeemed, don't we? You've got several songs about being redeemed. I am redeemed by love divine. That's all I'm singing for you. <laughs> glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I've been redeemed. Then did, did I get it right? Close enough. Thank you. I hope you can sing that song with honesty and sincerity better than I just tried. Not just a matter of making the notes right back and singing out a reality for you. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19, talking to Christian people, folks like you and me, I hope that's us. I don't know your heart. He says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Wow. He said, your fathers told you wrong. Historically, you've been told wrong. You've been led in the wrong direction. You have what is referred to here as vain conversation. Vain means empty. It means useless. It means futile. What is he talking about? He's talking about trying to be justified, trying to be forgiven, and trying to be redeemed by God by your good works. Keeping the law. Going to the temple. Making the sacrifices. Observing all the feast days and the fast days. He said, that's, that's what you were raised up to know and believe. But he said, I want to tell you something that's not right. That didn't redeem you at all. You have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. You've been trying to make yourself acceptable to God your way instead of God's way. Understand for sure, God wants us. God loves us so much that He wants us. He, he wants you. He, he wants a personal relationship with you. He wants you as His very own child. So when you're saved, you're born again, but you're also adopted into His family and you become His and you are redeemed. Redeemed means you've got a new owner. You've got a new owner. You become God's property, His precious property. Can you imagine God losing anything that He ever owned? <laughs> Can you imagine somebody stealing something from Almighty God? It doesn't happen. But when you have been redeemed, you become God's precious property. You become His very own child. And we cannot redeem ourselves, although most people do try. They have a semblance of a thought that, well, if I can just get it right, I don't have to trust Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I don't have to be a Christian to do this. I just got to act right. I just got to live a good moral life. I just got to keep some of the laws. I just have to go to church every now and then and have a big fat Bible that I own, you know, and look like one of those folks. It's a futile religion, if you will. Trying to get, become acceptable to God by being good and moral and kind and religious. But it's a futile religion. It's a salvation by works doctrine that never works. But outside of true Christianity, that's what you find. Study any religion you want to. 
And you're going to find, they'll tell you, if you keep all these rules, you do things our way, God's going to smile and He's going to let you into His heaven if they believe in God and believe in heaven. Just do it right. No. You're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And no other way. Just like there's no other way for your sins to be washed away, there's no other way for you to become God's child, His property, that he, it's so precious to Him. Silver and gold won't do it. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how wealthy the church is. That doesn't matter. We can't redeem ourselves. No matter how hard we try, it's impossible. Only God can afford the price of redemption, and there is a price. It was paid 2,000 years ago. Here's how God paid it. He watched His Son suffer and bleed and die for us. He watched the lifeblood of His Son come forth out of His body in the most horrible fashion. That's how God paid the price. That's how He purchased us. He bought your soul and mine with the blood of His Son, Jesus, if you're trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. What was it like? Let's look at the Scriptures and see what Jesus went through. Go with me now to Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22... In verse 44, we find Jesus the night before He's crucified on His face before His Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, agonizing. Agonizing over what He was facing. It says, in being in agony, He prayed more earnestly. And His sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Can you imagine that much stress? The medical term is, and I'll probably mispronounce it, hemotidrosis. I knew it. Hemotidrosis. And it's literally something that does happen occasionally when someone reaches a point of stress that is so immense that the capillaries in their veins begin to burst and it begins to pop out, and sweat turns to blood, and there's blood mixed with the sweat. They're in that much stress, that much agony. Jesus was stressed. He was stressed beyond our imagination because, you see, He knew exactly what was going to happen within the next 24 hours. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He, he, knew, he knew that Judas was going to come with those soldiers and betray Him. He called Judas' friend. He says, friend, have you come for me? Jesus knew. His heart was broken, but he knew it had to be. He, he was stressed so much as he, as he prayed over this. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was going to happen. He said, really, Father, I, I'd rather not have to go through this. But I love the last part of his prayer, and I'm so grateful he prayed it, and you can be too, because if he hadn't prayed the last part of that prayer, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If Jesus in the flesh, and you understand he was 100% man, 100% flesh, as well as 100% God, and his flesh did not want to go through what it was going to have to go through. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, he submitted to the will of his Father. All right, I'll endure it. Judas came, the soldiers came, they captured him. They took him to Caiaphas, the high priest's house. And it's not a real long walk from the Mount of Olives across the valley over there to Caiaphas' the high priest's house, which was south of the city and house south of the temple. And there they had a bit of a trial, if you will. They interrogated Jesus. And there the soldiers blindfolded him and hit him in the face. And they mocked him and said, Oh, you're a prophet. Prophesy. Who hit you? And then somebody else would hit him again. And somebody else would hit him again. It's all the time his blindfolded. Who did this? You're such a great prophet. He never answered that. The high priest asked him if he was the son of God. He didn't answer them either. They got furious. 
Jesus knew what was coming. He knew how horrible it was going to be, how he was going to be mocked, how he was going to be blindfolded, how he was going to be beaten. And according to tradition, although the Bible doesn't tell this, according to Jewish tradition, that there was a dungeon down below Caiaphas, the high priest house. There is a dungeon there. I've been in it. It's real. And there's a place in there where you could strap a man up, his hand stretched out between stone holes in the stone and stretch him like in a doorway to where he couldn't possibly move. And there's where they would scourge a man with a whip. Couldn't move, couldn't get out of the way. Tradition says that the Jewish soldiers scourged him before the Romans did later on that morning. I don't know if that's correct or not, but I do know he suffered horribly and he knew that was coming when he was praying so earnestly that he was sweating as it were great drops of blood. When the Jewish rulers got finished with him, they could not execute him. It would have been murder. <laughs> they didn't mind him being murdered. They just didn't want to be the ones to do it. So they took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And John 19 now, if you would, turn to that. And John 19, it tells us, beginning in verse 1. Well, they brought him to Pilate and then said, Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, and you may know that I find no fault in him. He had already told the crowd that was screaming for Jesus' cru Jesus's crucifixion, There's nothing wrong with him. I can't find him. He hasn't broken any laws. And verse 5 says, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, robe and Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. He's just a man. Look at him. He's drenched in his own blood. He's been beaten. He's got a crown of thorns on his head. His back has been shredded with a scourging whip. Just look at the man. Isn't this enough? That's what Pilate was trying to say. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine what it looked like? Can you imagine what it was like to be Jesus? Jesus having done absolutely nothing wrong. And the governor has declared three times, you did nothing wrong. But he says, in order to satisfy that bloodthirsty mob, I'm going to have you beaten with a scourging whip. I don't know if you've ever seen a scourging whip or not. I have a couple of them. and They're, they're what we would call a cat of nine tails. It's got a short leather wrapped handle and then some leather thongs that come out like fingers. And that would hurt a lot to be whipped with that. But the Romans, oh, they were masters of scourging. And they had one man who was in charge. He was called the lictor. That was his job, to scourge a man as much as he possibly could and bring him as close to death as possible without killing him because he wasn't supposed to die from the scourging because he was scheduled to be crucified. And so they would take the leather straps and strips and at the very ends they would sometimes tie lead balls on there. You ever get hit with a lead ball? Three or four hundred times? You get bruised. It brings the blood to the flesh. Right below the surface. A big bruise. So his back was probably totally bruised from the first lashing they gave him. And then if it was just leathered, that would you've been hit a few times. Can you imagine? His back would be bleeding. But they also had another trick that they did. On the ends of those strips of leather, instead of lead balls, sometimes they would put pieces of sharp metal, like fish hooks, broken pieces of pottery, anything that would cut and tear the flesh. And that's what they would use again and again until the flesh was almost completely gone off of Jesus' back. It was not uncommon for people to die from scourging. That's why the lictor's job was so important to know when to stop. How much a man could take. How strong was he? How old was he? How young was he? Could he stand one more lash? He brought it to the nth degree. 
they scourged Jesus. Isn't it interesting how the Bible just uses that one word? We couldn't stand it if we could have watched it. We'd have all turned away saying, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. It wouldn't have matter who it was being scourged. We didn't want to watch it anymore. But God sent the Son, our Savior. We couldn't have stood to watch it at all. In your mind's eye, I hope you can't stand to think about what Jesus went through for you. He was pouring out His blood. He left a lot of blood there on the floor. And then He put the purple robe on Him. He carried His cross out to Calvary with the crown of thorns on His head, his face totally drenched in His own blood. Oh, He was wounded terribly. Look at verse 6. It says, And when the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, after Pilate said, Behold the man. They cried out saying, Crucify him. They weren't satisfied. This isn't enough. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. I find no fault in him. Pilate knew Jesus hadn't done anything. He hadn't done anything wrong. He didn't deserve what Pilate already had done to him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Move on down to verse 18. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. He, meaning Pilate, delivered Jesus to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. And they crucified him crucified him he bearing his cross in verse 17 went forth into a place called the place of the skull which is called in Hebrew Golgotha and even today you can see the resemblance of the place of the skull what it looks like on the hillside where they crucified him and two others with him and on either side one and Jesus in the middle they crucified Jesus they nailed hands, nailed feet to the cross. Oh, probably not in the middle of the hand because that would tear out. It was probably more back in the heel of the hand where it's tougher and the bones are such that it would hold the weight of a man. And his weight was on his hands and the nail in his feet. They crucified him. At nine o'clock that morning, they crucified him. They lifted the cross and dropped it in the ground and his weight was hanging on the cross. In order to breathe, he would have to pull up on the nails to catch a breath and fall back. And again, and again, again, and again, just to breathe and to keep going until it was finished. Because you see, our punishment was not fully being paid on the first breath, the first minute, 10 o'clock, that's what he was doing. 11 o'clock, that's still going on. 12 o'clock, that's still going on. Until 3 in the afternoon, 6 long hours, our Savior hung on the cross, agonizing, bleeding. Can you imagine what it was like with a shredded back rubbing on a rough cross? We can only guess what the pain Jesus was in. That's the price He paid. That's how much God loves you and me. You see, when God paid the price, He sat back and watched that happen to His Son. God, how can you love me that much? I'm a horrible sinner. How could you love me that much to watch your sinless Son go through that? I can't comprehend it. I don't. I just know for those six hours, Jesus' precious blood drained slowly from his body until finally he got to the point that he could say, it's finished. The job was done. It's finished. And right before he died, according to Luke 23, 34, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't understand what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Can, can, can you imagine the love of Jesus? 
Can you imagine yourself, if you were the one being crucified, looking down at the ones who had nailed your hands and feet to the cross, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine looking out over the crowd that was screaming for your crucifixion, wanting you to go through this, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine Jesus looking down 2,000 years into the future into your, me and our lives and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I believe that's exactly what Jesus saw when He said, Father, forgive them. I think that's who He was talking about. I think He was talking about us too. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, you and I may not have had a hammer in our hands, but believe me, it was our sins that nailed Him up there. How can we acknowledge that fact and look to Jesus casually? Casually. Oh, Jesus, forgive me for what I did to you. The final verse I want you to look at is John chapter 19 and verse 34. We've seen the blood coming out of his body the night before he was crucified. He came through the pores of his skin and, and, and the blood from his face where he was beaten and, and the blood from his back where it was shredded with a scourging whip and the blood from his brow with a scourging from the crown of thorns and the blood from his hands and his feet. As if that wasn't enough, after he said it was finished, after he gave up the ghost or let the life breath come out of his body to where he willingly said, I'm through, and he died. Look what happened in John chapter 19 and verse 34. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. He was already dead. And forthwith came there out water, blood, and water. That spirit pierced the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart and out came the blood and the water. Do you realize until Jesus took his last breath, he could have stopped all of that at any point? At any point. Oh, we sang a song many times about he could have called 10,000 angels to set him free. <laughs> Jesus didn't need any angels. If Jesus had decided no, it would have been no. That was God. That was God. He, he had the authority. He had the power to say no, but he didn't. Remember, he surrendered to the will of his father and he did it. He could have stopped that man with that scourging whip. That <laughs> knew everything about that man, that lictor. He, he knew about him. He knew about his family. He knew about his friends. He knew everything. He could have stopped him. The man with a hammer in his hand, he could have stopped him too, but he never did. All the people in the streets were screaming for his crucifixion. He could have stopped all of that, but he didn't. He willingly went through that for you and for me. Oh my. Jesus took our punishment. And he poured out his life blood that he uses to wash us and wash away our sins. That's how His blood gets used to wash our sins away. He poured it out and now He takes it and uses it to take away our sins when we repent and ask Him to. But we've got to request it. He doesn't automatically do it. Have you requested it? Have you ever gotten to the point that you realize you need to be totally forgiven? You need to be justified. You're carrying all the guilt of your own sins even though you don't want to. And if you go to heaven like you are right now and stand before God on judgment day like you are right now, there's going to be a long list that they're going to read against you because you haven't been justified. You haven't been forgiven. Jesus' blood hadn't washed away your sins. If that's reality for you, listen, now's a great time to change that. He paid the price in full and now are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to accept Him as your Lord and your Savior? Oh, listen. If you've never experienced having your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus, all that He suffered was in vain. Do you need to do that today? I, I, listen... If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior and you haven't been forgiven, can I tell you that's why God brought you here this morning? 
He, he may have brought you here from across the road or from thousands of miles away. Doesn't matter. He wants you to hear the gospel message. He wanted to hear how much you to hear how much he loved you, the price that Jesus paid for you. And you can be forgiven because he wants to spend an eternity with you, but it's not going to do it in a sinful state. We have to be forgiven and made holy enough to spend an eternity with Him in His holy heaven. Has Jesus washed you in His blood? I don't know the answer to that. You, you would. You say, well, I don't know. Can I tell you, if you don't know, the answer is probably He hasn't. Wouldn't you think you'd know it if God had forgiven you of everything? Wouldn't you think you'd know it if you'd been born again, you had a whole new life in Christ? Don't you think you'd know it? So I'm going to say to you, if you don't know, you need to trust Jesus today and be saved. He will wash you. He will cleanse you. If you'll just repent of your sins and confess your need to Him and ask Him to do it. It's just not complicated. It's easy. But you've got to get past pride and get past whatever barrier Satan might be putting between you and holy God today. Pray. Confess it to the Lord and trust Him. Ask Him to do what only He can do with the only thing He can do it with, and that's His own blood. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Your love for us is amazing to me. Watching Your Son Jesus pay the ultimate price for my sins, that's amazing. I can't comprehend love that great, but you say you love us that much. Oh, dear Father, thank you for sacrificing Jesus. And dear Jesus, thank you for being the sacrifice, enduring it, going through all of that. And I know it was even more than what I had talked about this morning that you endured the spiritual separation from your Father. Oh, dear Jesus, thank you for being willing to pay the price so that my sins can be forgiven. And not just mine, but for everybody here. Lord, if there's even one person here this morning who has never been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus, let them know it. Let them know it without any shadow of a doubt. Let them know you need to be saved. You need to be cleansed, forgiven. Let them know you're willing to forgive them if they'll just call on Jesus to save them right now. Give them the faith to do it. And then, Father, give them the courage to come and make it public, saying, I just prayed and trusted Jesus as my Savior. And I am not ashamed of it. I'm so excited about what He's promised to do for me. Oh, Father, please. And Father, I pray for Christians that sometimes we get so involved in worldly stuff and other troubles and trials that we forget about the sacrifice of your Son. Remind us. Put us back on track. May that be the major focus of what we're about, telling others. Oh, Father, please help us. And Father, if there's somebody here that needs to join this church today, just bring them on. Have your way now. In Jesus' name, amen.